Hello, everybody. This is Derek Taylor from uh, HIST 140, U.S. History to 1877. This is the second introduction to uh, the second week's module of this eight-week summer course, um, or the readings for this week. So you have a couple modules. I have some assignments this week. You have your first exam over the first several chapters, four, four chapters of, uh, of uh, the textbook, America Concise History, and then three in Major Problems. And then um, you also have your first writing assignment, your short source assignment. I'll go through that a little bit here. And just uh, well, in a second, we'll go over and uh, do an overview of the uh, of the, the narrative for this for this week and the readings and everything. So let me share the screen here with you and see the source assignment here. Um, all you can be doing for that source assignment, I talked about this earlier, is just filling out some questions about a single source. One source, by the way, not all of them, just one source, one uh, one thing from the the reader um, but for this uh, this week you're doing um the stuff associated with the british atlantic world and growth diversity and conflict the two um the two uh um chapters in your textbook but there's also some other readings i'll go over the, the syllabus in a second here and show you what these are um you know you ended with the last uh couple of modules the you know, American, British American colonies have just, or English at that point, uh, have come to be established. And so these next two chapters are going to be talking about, as you can see here, is the rise of an organized British America. Uh, that's what that, that phrase Atlantic worlds is something that historians talk about, not just with the British, but in general, there's this sort of Atlantic, you know, from um, Northwestern Europe, you know, Spain, United States, uh, Spain, me, Britain, France, down to the Americas and then back, of course, to Africa with the slave trade. And so they refer to it as an Atlantic world. It's all connected by trade and stuff like that. And then, you know, politics. And so you'd be reading that chapter, Major Problems, uh, chapter three, um, which talks about some of the growth of the colonies. And then uh, in the other um, module four, Growth, Diversity and Conflict, that's the chapter in America. But also, I give you some British Empire docs. And so, uh, to, to read. I'll go through those in a second. So just to give you an idea, um, you know, what's happening. One of the things that's happening, let me stop the share for a second. One of the things that's happening with, you, know, you have Jamestown founded, then you have, you know, um, the pilgrims come over uh, in 1620. And then later on, the Puritans of Massachusetts found the Massachusetts Bay Company in 1630. And then all of a sudden, it begins, to, uh, there's an uptick you have by the middle of the century, uh, Maryland founded as a haven for Catholics because they're persecuted back in England. Uh, Lord Baltimore founds that colony and then uh, um, alongside Virginia and a few others, Rhode Island. And so, but what happens is that these things are, these are almost founded by private companies. They, they're not really, some of them have royal charters, but they're not really part of the British polity. And what's going to happen is going to be serious conflicts back in Britain. That's going to shape all this. In the middle of the 17th century, they have a series of civil wars in the 1640s, in the 1650s, uh, in which uh, King Charles I of England is defeated. He's executed, and they set up a republic briefly, and then a sort of military dictatorship, <laughs> dictatorship under the leader of the army, Oliver Cromwell, for 10 years. So for 10 years, there's no king in England, 1640s and 50s, 1649, 1659. Then um, while well, Cromwell dies, there's nobody else who can lead the army. They bring back the son of Charles I, which is Charles II. So you have this conflict going on uh, in um, in uh, in um, in Britain, which is going to impact the colonies because when the monarchy is restored in 1660, well, a couple of things you're going to see. They're still founding colonies after this, but that tension between the monarch and his parliament hasn't died down. There's a lot of conflict and it comes close to having more civil strife, more actual violence, it doesn't do that. He dies in his bed in 1685, but his brother James um, becomes king in 1685. And this is important because James as an adult converted to a Catholicism. Remember this is a Protestant country in 17th century England. They don't like Catholics, they're afraid of them. They associate them with absolute monarchs like Louis XIV who is overrunning Europe at that point with a dominant power. Uh, then they just don't like the religion. So they just distrust them. And so initially he's allowed to take power. Parliament is okay with this. But then James starts trying to basically change the laws to help his fellow Catholics because they can't vote or anything like that. And so he's trying to undo some of these laws. Parliament won't, won't, 
won't go along with this. So he dissolves the parliament and starts doing these things by royal decree, essentially. Um, uh, issuing edicts of religious tolerance, not just for Catholics, but for also Protestants who reject the established Church of England. And this makes him very nervous. The final breaking point is when he actually begins, when he actually has a son, um, because this is a long story short, he had married originally a Protestant wife, had a daughter who was married to the Dutch Stadtholder, the leader of uh, the Netherlands. She died, he married a Catholic queen, she was childless, they thought he's gonna die, and then we can just bring a Protestant back. Well, we had a kid, had a son. So that led Protestant leaders in England to basically invite the Dutch Stadtholder to invade the country and take it over, which they did. Um, and that's what the revolution of 1688 basically is. It's a, it's a coup d'etat by the, by the elite against this Catholic king. Uh, long story short, they defeat him. And eventually they will, after several years or so, um, if you're wondering why we're calling it Britain now, in 1707, um, They've had tensions with Scotland in the north of England, north of the island of Britain for a long time. They uh, signed an act of union in 1707, which still exists. And it creates the uh, United Kingdom of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, Britain for short. Uh, and so uh, it sets Britain, this revolution does, Britain on the path being an imperial power. England had not been an imperial power for many centuries. I've been a major European power for several centuries. Um, these things will all change this. Um, in fact, um, you know, in this part of this, I mentioned all this, I mentioned the American colonies, they become part of an imperial order. They're in part of an imperial society. Um, you had the founding of more colonies in the restoration period, New York, which they conquered from the Dutch, uh, the Carolinas, which was a sort of aristocratic um, uh, venture um, to get land in the Carolinas and, you know, form a colony there. And then Pennsylvania, which was land given to William Penn, who was a Quaker. The Quakers were also suspect persecuted types in England. William Penn's, uh, Charles II owed William Penn's father money. So he said, hey, take some of this land that I don't like. Just go ahead. It's, it's in the new world and he does. He founds Pennsylvania. But you also efforts by the, increasingly by the imperial, by the uh, British government to try to make the colonies part of the empire. They pass a series of navigation acts from the 1650s onwards, which tell them they can only trade with the mother country. They want to keep those resources that they have from the colonies within their own polity. The colonists mostly ignore a lot of this, but they increasingly want to do this. Uh, and in fact, just before uh, the revolution of 1688, again, remember James II, the Catholic king got kicked out, tried to create something called the Dominion of New England, which would um, you know, bring all these um, colonies under one, you know, especially the New England colonies were very Puritan. They didn't like Catholics a lot. So bring them under control, some sort of imperial control, what happens is the revolution of 1688 undermines all this. There were three separate rebellions in New York, uh, in Boston, and then down in Maryland, where in Maryland they'd had religious toleration, uh, a Protestant um, a Protestant association, as they call themselves, takes over and kicks out the Catholics there. So it's the end of that, that period in, um, um, in, um, in America because of that revolution. And what this does is the revolution, especially itself, I won't go into the details, it turns England and Britain into a great power for a variety of reasons. Um, it solves a lot of problems and they go on the offensive. They start fighting a series of wars immediately against Louis, uh, Louis XIV. That's one of the reasons why well, Wilhelm uh, of, of the Netherlands wanted to become king of England so he could use its resources to fight Louis XIV. And they do um, almost immediately. Um, turn it into a war machine. They fight a series of wars on the continent, but also um, in the 1690s and early 1700s, particularly the War of Spanish Succession is the big one against the, um, the French. Uh, Louis XIV is going to put his nephew on the throne of Spain. Nobody wants to see the Bourbon dynasty of France gain power like that, so they fight them. But also in America, there are two separate branch of uh, separate wars, King William's War from 1688 to 1697, which you notice the dates, um, uh, and Queen Anne's War. Uh, and this is between the French and the British uh, in North America. Uh, and then something called the Yamasi War in 1715, 1716, which was a, a battle between the Spanish and the British and their Indian allies in the Southern colonies. So becomes part of this war machine. It also becomes part of the um, British imperial economic system which is basically driven by slavery. 
um, it's what makes the empire work and profitable. Because honestly, those colonies in North America, eh, they don't do a whole lot <laughs> for, for the Brits. I mean, they, they send some raw materials back to them, but where they really make their money is from sugar and the sugar plantations in the Caribbean islands, uh, Barbados, later on Jamaica, uh, Jamaica, places like that. That's where they get their money. And it's after, it's really after 1688 that slavery takes off in, in the American colonies. And you saw some of that last time with some of the, the stuff in uh, Major Problem. And so you're going to have it being transformed and it becomes a big part of the population in southern colonies, like in the Chesapeake and the Carolinas. And so transforms it that way. They also, of course, begin to, by the end of this period we're talking about here, 1750, you had the beginnings of a native uh, African population in America, the creation of an African America on the plantations in the South. And, and I should mention, and in the North, there's slavery in the North up until uh, around the time of the end of the Revolutionary War. So all that stuff's in, uh, in here as well. Uh, you'll see in the readings, they'll talk about the differences between the colonies, the very different society of New England with its you know, very egalitarian social structure, but also the slaveholding South which they begin to model themselves on English gentry. They see themselves as wanting to be aristocrats. They're not really, but they want to be that way. And it's interesting, they're, they're interlinked economically speaking. Um, what New England does is provide food and stuff for the plantations down in the Caribbean. And of course the, the South, they produce tobacco and other things mostly there. Um, at the same time, your textbook will talk about something called salutary neglect. This is the other key thing here is that because Britain's becoming this massive major European power, they spend most of their attention is in Europe. They don't pay much attention to the colonies, which means they get, they govern themselves. They always have, they basically most of them have colonial assemblies and they basically run things themselves. And they like that that way. Um, and so what's gonna happen though over time and get us toward next time when we talk about the, uh, how the revolution is gonna happen, um, eventually Britain's going to, you know, consolidate their power in Europe and they're going to turn their attention back to the Americas. And what they're seeing, of course, is that they passed all these laws, the Americans are just ignoring that and they're like, hey, you're part of this empire, you benefit from British, you know, um, defense and all this stuff, you need to start obeying these laws, that's going to begin some tension later on uh, with them. And so you have that, you have that aspect of it. Then, of course, you have at the same time, by the time you get to the middle of the 18th century, you're having something like the creation of a British America happening. And it's hard to, it's hard to understand this because again, these colonies for the most part, again, you lived in the American colonies in the early 18, early 1700s. You didn't think of yourself as being an American, you thought of yourself as being a Virginian or a New Englander or you know, Pennsylvania, something like that. You're, that was your country, not the colonies. Maybe Britain, although you have a distant gang that's doing better for them. Um, and what changes this, you'll see in some of the readings, especially the essay in Major Problem, is called World of Goods by T.H. Breen. And uh, he'll talk about there are basically two things that create a sense, shared sense of American identity that'll feed into the revolution. One of which you'll see is war. <laughs> uh, the French and Indian War, these things create, they, they force the colonies to sort of work together for the first time. It, these wars, by the way, fishes from the 1740s onwards, give them a taste of what British imperial authorities like, and they don't like it. <laughs> um, but the other thing is actually commerce. It's actually being part of the British imperial system. Why? Because the colonists, in the colonies, they're not like, they don't have, in terms of absolute wealth, the kind of wealth they have in Europe, but they're pretty well off, the cost of living, you know, um, uh, goes up a lot and they can afford to buy stuff. They can afford to buy British goods. And that's what the argument of T.H. Breen's essay and he'll show you the details. The more they buy British goods, the more British they become. The more British they become, the more they become like each other as colonists rather than being, you know, seeing themselves primarily as Virginians and South Carolinians and all this other stuff. So it's an interesting thing that happens. You'll see this across, uh, across these readings. And in the, the uh, major problems, the um, the uh, the, uh, the chapter in major problems the pr uh, primary sources will talk about some of this. It'll also talk about some of the changes in the colony socially and culturally. Uh, one of the big things is immigration. 
immigration from Europe reshapes the colonies because originally it's mostly British English colonists, but uh, but now of course you have an influx of slaves, so the African population begins the boom. But you also have uh, basically two types of uh, uh, European population. They also have English continued English migration throughout the uh, throughout the uh, the century, uh, 18th century. But in particular, you're going to have uh, especially uh, by the end, by the time you get to the, the revolutionary period, massive immigration from Germany, mostly in Pennsylvania, the middle colonies, but also, and this is, I think, more important, Scots-Irish. That is either Scots from Scotland or people from Northern Ireland were Scots by descent. Why is that important? Because this goes back to, again, imperial stuff. Remember, I told you they had that union between Scotland and England in 1707. Some people didn't like it. So there were two separate rebellions in 1715 and 1745, which tried to overthrow that settlement, the revolution settlement. Uh, the one in 1715 almost succeeded and came close. 1745, not so much. But the point is, this led a lot of these Scots-Irish from, uh, from Northern Ireland and from Scotland to emigrate to the Americas, where they go into the backwoods of like the Carolinas and places like that, where they're very used to fighting. This is the Scots-Irish kind of clan, like it's a thing today, like in Kentucky and places like that. Uh, I don't like the English very much. Uh, in fact, they're the biggest, um, aside from the Germans, I think they're the biggest uh, European population in terms of migration. So you have this, your, your textbook emphasizes the diversity. Of course, you do have Native Americans and you have Africans and stuff like that. But in terms of who, who are actually part of political life, it becomes more diverse in that sense because those, those people can't vote and they're not really part of the part of the society when they can't uh, not part of political life. But you have, you know, German speakers. There are so many German speakers in the colonies that when the um, when the dust up begins with the, with the Brits in 1775, the Continental Congress at one point considers uh, making German the official language of the, of, of the United States it doesn't work. But there's so many of them that they, they think about that. Um, so in other words, the population becomes simultaneously more African, more European, but also more British. You have all these Scots-Irish and a few Irish immigrating to the colonies. So it gets changed by all this stuff. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, well, two things. I mentioned the wars already. The, the, um, the, um, the French and Indian War, which you know in your American history classes in high school, of course, that's that begin. That actually is the beginning of the larger conflict to the Brits, which is in Europe the Seven Years' War, 1754. They go to war with the French. Actually, George Washington gets himself captured. <laughs> is what starts it. They're going. There's there's debate. There, there's fighting over territory in the western parts of the continent that in the Ohio River Valley, which starts that. But that sets off a war in Europe, or it's part comes part of a war in Europe in the 1750s and 60s. Uh, and that's a huge, that's a huge turning point because after that war is over, again, the Brits have become a power, but for a long, for since the days of Louis XIV and before, France had been the biggest power in Europe, biggest population, most wealth, most land. Well, what happens is that war, 1763, it's not official, but the winner of that war basically is Britain. And this is kind of a revelation to people in Europe because up until then, they'd been wanting to emulate the French because they got the most power. Now it seems like the British, and one of the ways the Br British won, won that war is they came out with a lot more colonies than any other uh, power. They kicked the French out of India. They kicked the French out of North America. How they do that? Naval power. Uh, in fact, the Brits hardly even fought in Europe on land. They sent a few troops. They bankrolled their main ally, Prussia, which had a great army, and that's how they won. And so the point is, in these wars in the 18th century, what would happen is if one power came too big for their riches, you had other powers gang up on them in the next war. And that's what's going to happen in the American Revolution. In fact, it's the other oh, European powers, oh, wait, Britain's getting too powerful. Let's go check the Brits. So that's a big thing. And then uh, important thing. The other thing is, of course, in America is that because they have all these connections to, you know, the, um, um, the motherland, you know, there's a press and all that other stuff is that uh, I, different ideas filter into the colonies. Talk about the enlightenment, the European so-called enlightenment of the 18th century. There is a flourishing print culture in 18th century America, newspapers, but also books. Um, Benjamin Franklin is one of the founders of the American Philosophical Society in uh, Philadelphia. Franklin is kind of the star, intellectually speaking, of the colonies from the 1750s onwards, inventor, um, someone who 
<laughs> he gets around. I think I want to say he had 59 illegitimate children. <laughs> he made a lot of money, which is a good thing. He needed it. Um, but uh, yeah, he got around a lot. But he was also someone who was, uh, he became, he rose up through the, you know, you read this in your textbook to become, you know, um, all these things in the, in the colony of Pennsylvania. He was also representative of the colony of Pennsylvania to the British. He spent a long time in Britain, like the British, in fact. And um, so he'll become kind of a, like, a, a, definitely when he gets into the revolutionary period, when he goes to France as an ambassador, a sort of star uh, uh, there because of this. And so you'll have all these influences feeding into all the social and cultural changes that we already talked about here. And well, one more to talk about before we, uh, a couple of things to talk about here is, of course, there are religious changes in the colonies. There's a series of uh, Protestant religious revivals that hit the colonies in the 1720s, uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. It peters out before the revolution because of all the conflict, but um, this series of revivals will reshape colonial religion in a lot of ways. You read about this in the textbook um we'll go into this in too much detail but that's part of this as well um this this um it, what it is basically is it's i don't say it's an import from europe but you know how the the enlightenment's the age of reason and all this stuff well there's kind of a reaction against this in religious terms in places like germany and in britain in the 18th century where instead of emphasizing they would emphasize the rationality of christianity right that's john locke that's uh, deism, which is something that's prominent among people like you know, Benjamin Franklin. But there's also a countercurrent, which emphasizes a religion of the heart and feelings and having these ecstatic experiences where you speak in tongues and do all this other stuff and wild stuff like barking at a dog in these big mass meetings outdoors. Uh, that will filter through the colonies. Um, and in some ways cause conflict, social conflict, right? Because this is, Partly, you know, these emotional experiences become, they become the primary aspect of religion, not things like learning, right? So we have these, these it's a challenge to the, you know, establishment of places like New England where, you know, these colonial preachers, but the colonial preachers were very learned, right? These ministers, they were not stupid. They went to Harvard and places like that. They founded Harvard. And yet this, this idea that it's about individual experience and emotion is a challenge to that. Um, and then finally, just the, the last thing to mention is all the success of the Brits in the seven, seven Years War alters things dramatically between the, the Brits themselves and the um, and the um, and the colonists. Why? Well, now they've kicked all their competitors, the Spanish and the and the um, and the, the French out of North America. In other words, the, the colonists don't need the Brits' uh, military strength to defend them anymore. And of course, because you had all this immigration, because the colonies now have become more established, they have, there's no aristocracies in, in the colonies, but they have notable families. So it's becoming harder and harder to rise up to the ranks in these older societies. So what do you do if you just arrived or you're, you know, you're poor, you move west, you go in search of land, you cross into Indian territory, which you've been pushing that way anyway. But the thing is the Indians have been allies of the Brits during the war. And um, they signed treaties with them. In fact, immediately after the war ends, there's gonna be a, a rebellion called Pontiac's Rebellion up in you know, modern day Michigan. Uh, and the Brits have to put it down. But one of the uh, problems the Indians have is these colonists keep pushing west. And this is an elite conflict between the mother country and the colonists. So this time where America is growing into a major, it's growing into a society in its own right, still kind of disparate societies, but closer together. Uh, and it becomes a greater part of this uh, imperial power causes conflicts to lead to the birth of the country. Just wanna show you one thing before I uh, sign off here. And that are the readings for uh, module four, the British Empire docs. And um, it should say, ooh, it doesn't say that. Actually, it doesn't say down there. Hold on for one second. Click back here. It doesn't have an introduction there. It has an introduction down here. I should, I'll probably put move this and put it there there as well. Or, uh, source assignments. Um, uh, yeah. This is, yeah, comparison. And this is, um, this is an introduction to those primary sources I'm having you read for this week. And the two sources are two continental plans for union of the British colonies in North America. And um, um, one by Martin Bladen, one by Benjamin Franklin. And 
you know Benjamin Franklin, so who he is, he's this, you know, colonial figure, and uh, the actual PDF, I'll give you some introduction to that as well. The other man's name is Martin Blake. Martin Blake was a British politician, and he was a commissioner on the Commission of the Board of Trade and Plantations, and the Board, and Braid of, Board, and, uh, Board of Trade and Plantations was the body set up with the crown by the British crown to deal with its overseas colonies. And the thing to remember here is that it was the only, <laughs> only governmental body in the entirety of the British government that dealt with the American colonies, a handful of guys. There wasn't a lot there because they just ignored it for so long. And anyway, Martin Bladen wrote his report when they were, uh, when, uh, in 1739, when Britain had gotten to a war with Spain. And um, I need to get some backtrack on this because what had happened is you had Spanish ships in the Caribbean stopping British ships and you know shaking them down, make sure they weren't carrying contraband or something stolen from the British, Spanish colonies because they'd done that in the past. Um, and then one of them, um, uh, one of these ship captains, a man named Jenkins, got into an argument with these Spanish when they were you know, searching his ship, and one of the Spaniards cut his ear off. Why do I mention this? This is what started the war, <laughs> or gave the pretext for it. The people in Parliament wanted to start a war with the Spanish. Jenkins went before Parliament and actually showed them his ear <laughs> had been cut off to inflame the passions of the parliamentarians. Um, that's why initially this was called the War of Jenkins' Ear in Britain. So, fun fact. In any case, during this war, of course, you know, you have the Spanish in the Caribbean, but they also have outposts in Florida. And so his big concern, besides maintaining trade with the colonies, was defense. His main reason for this is military defense. And he says some very interesting things about what they're going to need to do, the Brits, to, to maintain control of the colonies. That's one thing. You'll see a very different plan. Well, actually, it's very similar for the most part to plan, but with different emphases uh, in terms of Benjamin Franklin, of course, who's a colonist. He doesn't see things quite in the same way. Definitely, they both see themselves as British. They both are, you know, the, it's hard. It's, it, I need to emphasize this. American colonists, right up to the time the fighting started in the 1770s, they were proud to be part of the British Empire. It's the most powerful empire in the world at that point. It, it's the freest country in Europe. Why wouldn't you want to be a British subject? and be subject to British law, which is so much better than being you know, French and stuff like that. Um, but you can see differences, obviously, uh, in the way they uh, view these things. Um, and so that's what you'll be reading uh, as long as the other stuff uh, for this week. So uh, I'll put that introduction, by the way, in the module, uh, module four as well. Yeah, stop share. So that is it. That's my little overview of the readings for this week. Um, remember, you have the, the first exam on the 19th. You have the first um, short writing assignment, which all you'll do basically, actually, let me, let me, let me do this, share the screen. So you share, uh, this is the chapter for major problems for this week, but you'll, what you'll do is you'll take one, um, one source, that is to say there are seven sources in the primary sources in the chapter. You might take this one, uh, Gutlieb Middleburger, German immigrant portrays difficulties in immigration of 1750, um, read through it, answer the questions in that sheet and then turn it in. Like, let me show you the sheet. That's that's basically that there. Go through that. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Source assignment one, primary, primary source. Basically, you'll answer questions, um, that sheet over primary, one primary source. Again, um, this isn't meant to be a long or difficult thing, just in a few sentences, answer each question, that's it. Uh, a short paragraph, a sentence or two will, uh, uh, um, will uh, suffice. Let me show you the actual sheet you're gonna answer the questions on here, down here. Yeah, source assignment one. Come on. Yeah, so that's primary source analysis. Answer this question, who created it? For what audience? Uh, if you don't know, guess, give me your best guess. Um, what is the social status? This is probably the most important thing. Uh, and that can mean, that's a vague term. It means all the things that make you, give you your place in society, your class background, your ethnicity, religion, political ideology, occupational, all that stuff, anything like that. Uh, again, uh, from of the sources maker, you know, what uh, second one is, what type of source is it? Written, visual, yada, yada, when, where was it made? How was it preserved? Again, if it doesn't tell you in the actual major problems, you can try and Google it, that's fine. Uh, but just give me something there. What does it tell us? 
again, when I ask that question, you know, don't just, you know, don't, you know, try to give it some thought, you know, don't take long enough to answer it, but don't just say, well, it says this, says that. It says, remember, what important information? Why is it important? What important things can it tell us? Um, fourth question is about bias. You guys tend to like this one. Uh, I think you want to see like everybody's biased. And I don't mean, by the way, somebody who's intentionally, you know, I don't mean someone who's obviously, easy example, like they're being racist, obviously, but just what things do they tend to favor, which things do they tend to disfavor. It's more of a neutral assessment here. That's what I'm thinking about. And then is anything in their background might indicate why they have that. And then finally, this is, again, it's a general generic question. How does it relate to the other sources that you're reading? Uh, uh, does it, what, can you tell how important it is vis-a-vis -vis some of the events you've studied? You know, uh, is, uh, you, you know, that one, let me put this up here again. Um, where is it? Oh, yeah. Uh, hold on for a second. Gottlieb Middleberger, to give you an example. You know, his little excerpt is on um, immigration. So, you know, that's the event or process that would be obviously significant for. It tells you about you know, who's immigrating from what country. You know, again, it's evidence for that, supports you know, how you might help you understand that stuff from the direct perspective of someone who was involved in all that. So that's the, uh, that's all, um, all I really wanted to get through there. Well, that's all I really want you guys to get at, to do that, um, to get out of that assignment. Again, don't give you grading, it's 10 points a piece, but it's not supposed to be that difficult. It's just meant to give you the habit of thinking about those things when you look at the past. And who was this guy? Why was he doing this? You know, is you know what you know what were his motivations? Those sorts of things. It's a good habit to get into. Um, as long as you fill out the answers, unless you're doing something crazy, you sh you should be fine in terms of a grade. But that's what I want you to do for that assignment. Uh, and that is all. I need to make sure I got that in there. And yeah, remember the exam. You get one shot, so you can take as long as you like. But make sure you've done the reading and everything. Um, and uh, yeah, that uh, that is all for this week. Um, hope you guys enjoying the coast, uh, course so far. We'll be getting some down the readings and hopefully uh, um, I hope you guys do well in the first assignments. Uh, that is all. We'll see you guys next week. Take care. Uh, have a good one. Stay cool. Hot out there. Bye-bye.